The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed during this or any broadcast belong solely to our guests or our hosts. These broadcasts do not represent or reflect the views of their employers, sponsors, or affiliated organizations. Welcome to the Flipboard EDU podcast with your host, William Jeffrey, where we collaborate, communicate, and educate with the greatest educators in the world on Flipboard. Let's start the show. Welcome back, Flipboard fam. This is your favorite coach, Coach Jeffrey, and I have another amazing guest here today, Miss Tina Shane Blanchett. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Hey. Tina Shay, tell our listening audience a little bit about yourself. Hello, my name is Tina Shay Blanchett, and I am a former high school math teacher. I taught high school math for about 10 years before I became a full-time trainer and consultant. I currently serve as a professional development specialist for Equatio at Texto, and I just wrote a book. Yes, I met you at ISD, and I, I just having to just gravitate to your personality so I guess we'll briefly talk about our first reading with text help. What do you do at text help? So basically, as a former math teacher, I am very into anything that math teachers can use to enhance their instruction. And so I started working for text help probably about four years ago as an independent consultant. And I did all of the training around Equatio, which is a really powerful tool designed by and for math teachers. And so now I basically do all of the training for Equatio. You told me that you wrote a book. That's what I want to feature here today. Let's talk about your book. Give us the name of it. And <laughs> I am a right leader, plans educator. And I wrote this book, honestly. It's really nice to be able to write a book to fill a need. And I know that there are so many educators out there who are interested in entering this world of consulting and training and traveling. And I can say that when I was doing it, I got that question all the time. How did you get into doing this? And before I started doing it, I was asking that question. And it just seemed like, honestly, a lot of secrecy around it. I don't know if you've experienced that. But what I really wanted to do is just pull back the curtain on what it takes to get started how to build your business. There are a lot of folks who are doing it, but don't necessarily have the business aspect of it figured out. So I just really wanted to create like a one-stop shop, a how-to guide. And I know as teachers, we love a how-to guide, right? So this was yeah. definitely written with teachers in mind and helping them to really explore this new career path of becoming an educational consultant. So let's talk about becoming an educational consultant. I know a couple that are on Twitter. I, I, every time I think of educational consultancy in this space, I always got to think of Dr. Will. Do you know who Dr. Will is? Of course I know Dr. Will. I interviewed him for the book. Yes, yes. So let's talk about what did you and Dr. Will talk about when you start your book? One thing about Dr. Will is he is about his money. Okay. We actually, I want to say, let's see if I can find where he was quoted in a book because I know I quoted him in the money chapter. And I want to say that's chapter five. Let's see. Yes, chapter five. So do you mind if I read a little quick excerpt? Hey, it's your book, so do your thing. All right. Chapter five, making and managing your money. Being an educational consultant can be very lucrative. Dr. Will Danport, nicknamed Dr. Will, is an educator, digital transformation strategist, writer, and podcast. In 2019, he released the film titled The Edupreneur, that was featured by Forbes as a documentary about teachers turning towards entrepreneurship. Dr. Will talked about how he felt when he received payment for his very first educational consulting gig. Did I just make $2,300 in seven hours doing something that I do every day on my job? I'm thinking this is almost as much money as I make in a month. Like Dr. Will, many of the consultants interviewed for this book were pleasantly surprised when they learned just how much more money they would make as an independent contractor than as a school or district employee. In 2021, educational consultants made over $15,000 more per year than full-time teachers, according to Glassdoor. Nevertheless, many interviewees also reported making and managing money was an area in which they struggled significantly. Wow, that's great. 
Now, before I get to the making and managing the money or the managing money part, let's talk about those people who are making money. All right. So I'm going to start with you. What led you on this journey for you to leave the classroom and then start your own educational consulting group? Honestly, I think that as an educator, when you're good at what you do, people want to learn more about what you're doing. Right? I'm sure you've had that experience as well, especially if you're tech savvy, right? Because it's really hard for teachers to stay on top of the latest tech tools. And so if you're one of those people, then you end up being like an ambassador, right? Everybody's asking you, OK, what should we use? How do we use it? And so that was the role I played. Honestly, very early in my career, I got my first professional development position when I was only three years into the classroom. I was a PDRT, and that's called a professional development resource teacher. So basically, it was my responsibility to not only teach my students, but to also offer job embedded professional development for my peers. Now, that was not an easy job to have because, again, I was really young in my career, and I was responsible for training teachers who were old enough to be my teachers. But at the same time, I, it was just something that I was always talented at. And as I, as I continued to do that work in the classroom and at my school, opportunities presented themselves for me to attend conferences and present at conferences. All of this was happening while I was still a full-time classroom teacher. And when I started presenting at conferences, another name that you may know, Vicki Davis, cool cat. Vicki Davis, the cool cat Vicky teacher. First Yes, she was one of the first, and she's also someone I interviewed for this book. She was one of the first consultants that I met. Like, she was one of the first people who I really thought, wow, you can do this for a living. Now, fun fact, Vicki Davis is not a full-time consultant. She has a day job. She works at a school, but it has not stopped her from being able to make a name for herself. And really, I think she's one of LinkedIn's top 50 education voices of 2021. So she is a big deal. And so I bring that up to say that a lot of times when people look at the freelance educator, they assume, oh, I have to do this full time and I'm not really ready to do that. When in fact, a lot of the people who I interviewed for this book are still working full time as teachers, working central office positions. And that doesn't mean that you can't be a consultant. It just means it'll look different from you. Another person who I interviewed from the, for the book, Rachel Denae Paw. Another name that you may have heard. She's a really prolific writer. A quote from her is that I am a full time teacher and a full time consultant. <laughs> so, but it's also one of those things where my consulting doesn't necessarily suffer because I'm a full time teacher. As a matter of fact, my experience is that when you're still in the classroom, it's really easy to pull content, right? It's really easy for you to say, I did this thing with my kids yesterday and let me show you how it works. I feel like I went off on a tangent there, Coach Jeffrey. Hey, it's, a part, it's, it's made for people to go off on tangents. It's, it's good. It's good. But we were talking about what encouraged you to leave the classroom and to take right. this leap. Based. So basically, so that brings me back to Vicky. OK, so I started seeing her. She was the keynote speaker at our state technology conference in Louisiana. That was LaCue. And I just remember being in awe of her. Like I sent her keynote and I was just wrapped. And then she did like, she did a breakout session. You know how like sometimes they have the keynote speaker and then they'll go do a regular session and like it's packed with all the fans from the keynote. And so I'm yes, just yes. on the floor <laughs> in that session and just hoping to get to talk to her. And of course I did. Years later, I saw her at ISTE. We've crossed paths many times over the years since then. And I can remember as soon as I had the opportunity, I asked her if I want to do what you're doing, if I want to. And I don't even think I called it a consultant at the time because I don't think I knew. I just knew that traveling and training teachers was a thing and I wanted to do it. And so I asked her what was her advice. And I'll never forget. And this is a book that I quoted in my book. She recommended the book Start by John Acuff. And I read that book and I was like, Okay, I got to get started. And I will say again, it was one of those experiences where I just realized that this was something that I'm good at. And I left the classroom. I worked a central office position for a few years. And funny story, a company called me. Actually, that's not true. A company emailed me. A company emailed me and said, hey, would you be interested in traveling and training teachers? And I was like, yes. <laughs> it's writing this book is interesting because for me, a lot of the things that are in this book, I wish I knew when I first started. Right. But I will say at the time that I got contacted by that company, by the way, that company was the Bureau of Education and Research, BER. 
They're the largest provider of professional development in North America. And so a lot of the work that I've done, a lot of the exposure that I've gotten has been through BER. And the reason why BER reached out to me is because I had a blog at the time, Blade Chip blog, of course. <laughs> and I was basically just documenting everything that was happening in my classroom. And so when me and my students, I got a grant to get a class set of iPads and I was documenting all that. So when they were looking for someone to train on using iPads in the man classroom, they stumbled upon my blog. So one piece of advice that I would give, I'm not sure if I even gave this piece of advice in the book, but one piece of advice I would give is to put yourself out there, right? And make the work that you're doing in your class so public. So if someone is looking for what you have to offer, they can find you. Yeah. Now, very good thing. It is counterproductive for educators to put themselves out there to a degree. You know what I'm saying? It's like a stigma that, oh, you, why are you showcasing this and who do you think you are? Have you ran into that, that wall before? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'll give you a great example of this. And I am warning you and everyone who's watching this video, please do not Google anything that I'm about to share with you, okay? This is just a story. We're gonna say it's hypothetical, it's not real, okay? Let's just say, that I decided to make some math rap videos with my students, okay? okay. And this was many years ago. And I actually remember the first time that I did this math rap video with my students. We actually did it because we'd entered a contest. I was very big on video. That was always a big thing with me. I loved doing video. And so I remember me and my students entered a district-wide video contest, okay? And we did that video contest. I don't know. It was on something like, Maybe I remember it was calculus and plain English. That's what it was, right? And we entered the contest. We made what we thought was a really great video. And we lost the contest. And the people who beat us out was another school that did a video on the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So we're not talking like advanced math. But they rapped about it. And we were like, oh, okay. So that's what we have to do. We have to rap. Couple that with this pair of teachers in Ohio. I'm sure someone has heard of Westerville South. They did this series of math rap videos that were just like all the rage on YouTube. And my kids love them. But these were two guys in Ohio. Okay. Suburban Ohio. And we're here in New Orleans. So we're like, yeah. we think we can accept the challenge. So yeah. Made this math rap video. It ended up winning the state technology. Like the state conference had a video contest for students. We won that. It was a big deal. But at the time when we were filming the video, I can remember some of my colleagues saying things like, oh, we are here trying to teach. And Tina Shane, they're rapping with those children. It was definitely a thing like, is there rap on the test? Okay. So technically, yes, it was anything. But still, you know that. And so... What was interesting is that after we did this video and we got all these accolades and all this recognition, all of a sudden, those very same naysayers, the same people who were like, I don't know about this. Tina Shea, can I be in your next video? Like, I don't know. Yeah. We're very busy. Hey, the cold crawl while back then, they need them all me now, my day. That's actually Mike Jones. And that's one of my favorite. Yeah, Mike, Mike Jones. Mike Jones. I'm sorry. Mike Jones. Mike Jones. That's Mike Jones. And that's the truth. Like, the truth is that people are not going to be like drinking your Kool Aid if they don't know what it tastes like. I just think it's important for you to, again, do the work, make it visible. Do the work and make it visible, and you will attract your tribe. Everybody is not meant to be a part of your tribe, and that's okay. So we don't want to spend too much of our time or energy on folks who don't understand or are committed to not understanding what we do. And I have to tell you, with being a freelance educator, being a consultant, there I feel like Tommy from Martin. <laughs> you know, y'all doing Tommy? I have people in my life, whether it's family members, friends. Every time they see me, they're like. What do you do again? And I'm like, girl, it's okay. You don't have to understand. But I did write it. Hey, you made your learning visible. And that is what we actually want students and teachers to be able to translate into. And man, you made a lot of good points in your story. That was a really great story. The issue is that a lot of times teacher, high performing teachers like yourself ends up in silos. And so how do you break that stigma 
that a high performing teacher like yourself or high performing educator gets into a form where nobody really can understand what they're doing and not really they're committed to misunderstanding. How do you get through that? One thing, you know, that I talk about all the time, anybody who knows me has heard these two words, scarcity and competition, scarcity and competition. I think that sometimes it even, I just did an interview for this book not too long ago with, you might know my friend Desiree, educator Alexander. Desiree, I'm like, great. Yeah, I did did a YouTube video with her and, you know, she had some guests on and people were asking questions like, what if so-and-so next door wants to steal my fill in the blank, right? Steal my lesson, steal my presentation, steal. And something that I had to learn early on, and I'm not going to say that I've never bought into this because I absolutely have. And I think especially when you are an educator, we are we often find ourselves in spaces where we have to be like the representative of the whole race. And so this manufactured scarcity, right, in a lot of the environments that we come into, that we start to buy into it, right? It's okay, I am the Black girl who works for this company. So if another Black girl shows up, She's automatically my competition. That does not have to be the case. She could be your ally. She could be your apprentice. She could be your teacher. You don't know what this person has to offer. So I think that as long as we continue to buy into scarcity and competition, then we'll never be able to collaborate with others and really build this capacity that we naturally have, right? So that would be my piece of advice to anyone is to not buy into scarcity or competition. So what is the that of scarcity and competition, abundance, abundance. There's enough to go around. There's enough opportunity to go around. I think when you drill down into educational technology, right, in particular, this is an area where a lot of people are feeling scared because they keep seeing people getting certifications. You keep seeing people entering this space. And so you, it's very easy to fall into this mindset of, oh, no, <laughs> it's too many people. Even with writing this, I'm sure that someone sees this book and says, why is she telling all our secrets? <laughs> right? Lies are we more people. Yeah. All those people. When you think about the millions upon millions of students in this country who are receiving a subpar education for so many reasons, there can never be too many of us who are there to help teachers be better at what they do, right? So this idea that we have to keep this hush, we have to keep it closed, I just don't buy into that. And another thing I know is that at the end of the day, even if someone gets up behind me and presents on the exact same topic, she still stole my presentation, right? You can steal my presentation, but you can't be me. And so that's the thing that I know is that no, nobody can be me better than me. So you can present the same information. You can take my slides, honey. You could do it all. You still won't show up as I do. And so knowing that about myself, I think once I figured that out, I was okay. And when it comes to technology, they could Google all this information anyway. I'm not giving them any information that they can't get from somewhere else. So when they show up for my training, for my event, when schools and districts hire me, they're hiring me for who I am and not necessarily the content. So I think that when I figured that piece out, it it put me in a place where I'm happy to share. I'm happy to collaborate because I'm not in competition with anyone. Man, I just had this conversation with a prominent person in educational podcasting. And one of the things we had talked about was people stealing. Because one of the things that happened to myself is, this is a hypothetical situation. I shouldn't say it happened to me. Let's say when I first started podcasting and some of the shows that I started to put on, I noticed that some of the other educational podcasts who just came up either right after I interviewed or while we were in the same space, a lot of our topics seem to overlap. And I was like, wow, that's really amazing how that happens. And I, and the first time it happened, I was bitter. But then some said, you know what? You, you who you got to be, you got to be Coach Jeffrey. And I'm a principal and I consider myself a coach. And so from there, I know the game. And there's one thing a coach can do. A coach got to be able to see the game and recognize it. This is what it is. So now I need to do what a coach does. Not that being a principal is not a bad thing. I guess I am a principal, but to my deep down core, I'm going to be me. And then even further than that, what's even further than that is that the good Lord put 
greatness in everybody. And let, I have a new mindset on what you said, and I appreciate you said it on my show because it, it literally agrees to the way I feel about this thing called education. Yeah, teachers, if nobody steals, it's teachers. We, how we survive, honey. I can't tell you how many times I sat in somebody's session and I was like, oh, I'm going to hang them. <laughs> and that's really that's what great educators do. If you're not trying to steal, then it, of course you want to give attribution, but a lot of times you don't get attributions. You know what? Taking that stealing thing is, we. I'm going to label that as collaboration, which is why I just, I changed my name to, I mean, the theme of my podcast is communicate, collaborate, communicate, and educate. So that is what it is. It's going to be some transferring of information. Yeah. And something else, I don't want to sort of be like, sometimes you'll not say what I say. So I think some people read it as I'm this Pollyanna who doesn't understand. There are some whack people out here. Not very clear about that. <laughs> I'm really I'm here. Missing the whackers. Great. But the body will learn is that like, I don't have to make it my business to do anything about that because they're going to be there all they're going to be their own undoing. And my experience is that sometimes the universe will take you out of what you're doing and say, hey, look at this. Just so you can see it happen, look like you can start moving forward that it's going to happen. It may not happen. No, it might not happen. Exactly. She would have had it happen, but it will happen because it just can't stand it. Right? And that's yeah. why I have to be so careful about how we move. Like, ever since I entered this space, like, I've really tried to be Mindful of even just being a better person because I'm like, I need my karma to be right. I'm taking risks out yeah. here. <laughs> I need hey, to be right. Yeah, then you are 100% right. Now, let's talk about management of what of your resources because that's the next thing as being an educational consultant. It is making sure you can last. So how does that work? I'm really glad you asked me that question because when I talk about money, right, and even that quote that I read you earlier, I don't want people to get it twisted and think that you're just going to be balling out of control because that's going to be further from the truth, okay? You, you'll make more money, but keep in mind that the reason why you're making more money is because you are, when they're paying you, they're not necessarily paying you as an individual, as an employee. They're paying your business, and there are costs associated with running that business. Even if it's just, you still have costs, right? You still have right. to punish yourself. You still have to pay self-employment taxes. Right on top of the regular income taxes that you would have to pay. I can't tell you how, you know, who I interviewed to that was one of the biggest issues is taxes. Because what happens, right. you get this pile of money from your client and you're like, yeah, hey. especially if you're not, especially if you're not working a full time job. And fun fact, I was a full time consultant for seven years before I got hired by Texel. So I've been out here. OK. And when you're right. out, a lot of times you not get paid on a regular basis. Right. So you may have been waiting months for this big check to come. And when the check shows up, you should pay your taxes and you should put aside money for this. And but at this point, you got a pile of bills waiting. and You pay those bills. Now, one thing about your taxes is that you can pay them now or you can pay them later. But you're going to pay. But you're right. Oh, wait. I would not put that money on the side if you want. But then when tax time comes around, you know, if you're looking crazy. One thing, one piece of advice that I give in the book is try your best. If I could give you one piece of advice that I needed to take was put aside that tax month. OK, it really the recommendation is about 25 to 30 percent. Right. That's about how much you should be putting aside, even if you have a full time job. Because remember, if you are making your consulting money on top of your nine to five, that might not even push you into a new tax bracket, right? And that money is still taxable income. So me, another thing that I do is I do single and zero. I've been doing, I have three kids. I still do single and zero because I want Uncle Sam to take the maximum amount out of my paycheck, hoping that will offset some of my tax debt for that additional income. So that's a piece of advice. But when it comes to managing your money, I think above all, taxes is something that you need to consider. Another thing about managing your money is just know that like you're not you're not going to be making a bunch of money that's free and clear. And so that's something that's another quote from that same chapter. Let's see. That same chapter from my friend Jim Sill. Okay. Australia Bank's NTech consultant Jim Sill of Deploy Learning shares. I wish somebody would have told me about money and how to manage my taxes. We all get into consulting, I think, because we do good work and we're pretty confident we can get business. 
But how do I manage the money I'm bringing in? How do I manage QuickBooks? When do I hire an accountant? When do I hire a bookkeeper? He continues. Then you do the work, they send you that check, and you're like, woohoo, I can't believe that just happened. Then you have to start going, how much of that do I get to pay myself? And how much do I leave in my company? Because you can't give yourself that whole check. And so that's really the main idea of chapter five is you can't give yourself that whole check. Okay. You can't say, oh, I got a $5,000 check. I'm going on vacation. Oh, I can finally buy the fill in the blank. No, you really have to think about how much of that money are you putting aside for taxes? How much of that money do you want to reinvest in your company? Right. Are you going to Is this a good time for you to get some business cards printed or to hire somebody to work on your website or even hire an assistant? So there's lots of things that you need to consider, but just know that you can't give yourself that whole check. So I think that's another point of this podcast. You can't give yourself that whole check. That's a great quote. That is a great quote. That's a great quote. So where can our listening audience find you at? So basically... My name is really Googleable. <laughs> there are not a lot of Tina Shays out there. That's not true. There are a lot of Tina Shays. There's a pop star who has my name. But if you no. put in my last name, it's me. Okay. So if you put me gotcha. Blanchett, you can find me. My website is MissBlanchett.net. That's M S B L A N C H E T dot net. So that would be a place to go to learn more about me, to buy the book, of course. The book is on Amazon. It's on Lidge. Routledge is my publisher, so you can buy it from there. I think last time I checked, Routledge was running a 20% off sale on the book, so that might be a good place to start if you wanted to get it. But basically, Google me. Yeah. Google. What about all social media? Do you have a Twitter or... On Twitter, so Blanchett Net. Also, the Freelance, I'm sorry, Freelance EDU 22. But we have a Twitter for the book as well as for me personally. But I'm not the most active person on Twitter. I'm going to warn you now. Okay, I'm working on that. So this very broke me. But yes, yeah. Blanchett Net and Freelance EDU 22 are where you can find me on Twitter. Great. Thanks, Lynn. All right, people coming on the show, and you have a great day. All right, thanks. Flipboard fam, it's now time for flip tips. Did you know that you can add captions, images, and links to a Flipboard magazine? There are a couple of options for adding content to your magazine. You can tap the plus when you find an article in Flipboard that you want to flip into your magazine. Additionally, you can use the compose feature to add a personal touch to your magazine. You can add a caption, an image, or a URL post to your magazine. Post directly to your magazine on Android by going to your profile, select magazine or create a new one, tap the pencil icon at the top, add a caption, image or link, then hit post. If you have an iPhone, you would go to your profile, select a magazine or create a new one, tap the pencil icon at the top right, add a caption, image or link, then hit post. We can't forget about the web. On the web, you would click the pencil icon in the top bar, select the magazine or create a new one, add a caption, or paste the link. Images in the app only, not on the web. Then you would click flip. Flipboard fam, it's that easy. I love Flipboard. Every story on Flipboard is a plus. Are you looking for a podcast about education? Flipboard EDU podcast is a great podcast that focuses on digital, remote, and future learning. We will explore how to use Flipboard in education and how it can enhance instruction. You'll hear from teachers, students, and experts who are using this amazing tool in their classrooms. It's not just an educational resource, but also a community of people who want to share ideas with one another. Hey, join our community today. Share your stories, ask questions, or even submit content for us to feature on the show. We want everyone involved in this conversation so we all can learn together as we move into the future of education. This is your favorite coach, Coach Jeffrey, and I look forward to you becoming a part of the Flipboard family. Click here now to follow our podcast. Until next time, family.
Flipboard fam, thanks for sticking with me on this episode. I want to thank Tina Shea Blanchett for speaking with us about her book, The Freelance Educator, which is available on Amazon right now. We've covered a lot over the last few minutes from Tina Shea's experience as a freelance educator and how she got to where she is today. To her tips from budding entrepreneurs. You will undoubtedly find inspiration in her story and be able to put her advice to use in your own journey if you're on that path. As always, a special shout out to Crystal Vanderboom and Aileen Laylor for their edits on the Flipboard Educators blog, All Things Marketing and Education with Elena Leone, My EdTech Life with Fonz Mendoza, Education and Lease with Kendrick Thomas, and the leader of learning, Dan Kranz. Don't forget to subscribe to our Flipboard EDU podcast magazine and the Flipboard podcast, The Art of Creation with Mia Quadriello. Our podcast is available globally and everywhere you listen to podcasts. So please share our podcast with an educator or a colleague. So until next time, family, every story has a plus. Plus.